Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, once again we thank you. First of all, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and salvation is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the perfect and untarnished work of the redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for blessings that money cannot buy. We thank you for blessings that money can buy. We thank you for the gift of health and the gift of long life. We thank you for the country Nigeria. We thank you for all of the brethren here, online and on site. We are grateful. 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 Thank you for yesterday's election. Thank you because the will of God has prevailed. The will of God has prevailed. The will of God has prevailed. Thank you because this country is doing well. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you because the hand of God is upon your people. It's upon them for success. It's upon them for good. It's upon them for joy. The Bible says that no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. It says every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned in judgment. Thank you because every tongue that rises against you is condemned. Every tongue that rises against you is condemned. Every weapon fashioned against you is, is cancelled. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you, Holy Father, because your people prosper. They prosper in this season. They prosper this year. They prosper in life. They prosper in the industry. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are blessed above measure. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please, you can have your seats. Glory to God. All right. So this morning, we're going to conclude our series on discipleship. And let me tell you how we're teaching harvesters. If you notice, every, you may not notice this. Every Sunday, you may think the topics are disconnected, but they are not. What we do is that every month, there is a focus. And someone says, why do you do that? Because I believe that for you to properly exhaust the topic, you need to go over and over and over it again. So, you know, for the past two months since January, we began the series on discipleship. And as February ends, we're going to end and we're going to move to another series, which is very powerful next month. And in the series of discipleship, the focus is simple. The focus is to challenge us to move from just being a Christian to a disciple. Someone say, what does that mean? I thought I was a disciple. Listen to this. You can be a Christian and not a disciple. The same way you can be a child and not responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. You can, you know, you, 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 you need to be a disciple. You need to be a disciple. So we're looking at the different components of what disciple, what following Jesus would look like. What following Jesus will look like. And we looked at we looked at the concept of if you want to follow Jesus Christ, you must belong to a family. We looked at the church as a spiritual family. And and the reason I'm saying so is that many of you want a church to be a place of transaction. That's not the way God designed the church. If you read the Bible, you will see Paul saying to Timothy, My son Timothy. He used those words. He used those words in a very powerful way. Because the son, the church is designed. Sorry, just a minute. <clears throat> so the church is designed as a family and until you know you want to give me water thank you yeah so the church is designed as a family and the reason why that is important is this I don't know who is here that you have a perfect family. Everything is okay with all your brothers, your sisters, your mom, your dad, your, their wives and their husbands and their children. If you have that kind of family, please raise up your hands. I want to pray to be in your family. So what does that mean? No family is perfect. The same thing with the church. In the church, you're going to have crazy people sometimes. You're going to have people that dating three or four people. You're going to have people that want to take another person's husband. You're going to have people that are very are very holy you're gonna have people that are not very holy you're gonna have people that are doing so well that are not doing so well but that's what the church is so sometimes when people say the church did this to me sometimes it's the fact that you expect too much from the church because you don't expect that they're like you because someone said the church is full of perfect people that's a lie because you are there 
and you're imperfect. So even if you were perfect before you came, as soon as you joined the church, you destroyed the perfection. So when you deal with, so, so, and that's why sometimes someone says, ah, Pastor, I met this guy, he's a great guy. He even attends our church. I say, what does that mean? It means nothing. It, it means nothing. You can as well have met him in the mosque. Because even demons come to church on Sunday. Don't you know that? They come, you know, demons love to come to a great church like this to check out what is happening and report back to headquarters. Maybe the one you found was a demon possessed one. Praise God. So, so this is very important. This is very, just the way you deal, just the way you deal with this. It, it's, it's in your mentality. How the church is structured. So you want to do business with someone in church. You must do your due diligence. Because he may just not be a good guy. He may have received Jesus Christ, but he's bad in business. And he might just be a thief that's recovering. <laughs> Glory to God. So the reason why I'm saying so today is that, so, but the ultimate thing, so in a church, the goal of the church, so people come into a family, but when they come into a family, the goal is to recruit them into an army. So let me give you this example. Everybody look at me. So when people come to church, the first thing is come and see. That's what just come and see. Come and see. So when you come to church, you tell, hey, my pastor is good. Come and see. The preacher is good. Come and see. You know, and the choir is good. Come and see. It's about come and experience something. But that's where you start from. But that's the way you end from. Where do you end from? Come and die. When, when Peter, James, and John just can say, come and see. But at some point, just guys told them that if any man will come after me, he will die first. So what I'm saying is that you have to move. And this is a powerful message. You have to move from the common sea Christian to a Christian that is dead to the things of the world. The major problem with church is that we have people that have stayed in church for a long time. And they're in the come and see face of their Christianity. They have not entered a dying stage of their Christianity. And that's why you can see someone, you join church and your habits have not changed. You cannot be born again and your habits don't change with time. Your habits, see, there are things you drink, you should stop drinking. There are things you smoke, you must stop smoking. Someone say, is shisha okay? I'm never going to get to argument with you. Just do when Jesus Christ is there. Just sit down with Jesus Christ. You know, because my problem is that most people that do shisha, they don't do shisha because they want to. It's, it's the worldliness. It's a fact that, you know, if you would do it for yourself, that's something else. It's a fact that you want to be amongst them. You want to show that you are not behind. Someone said, am I saying shisha is right or wrong? That's not my question today. My question is this. Will you do it if Jesus Christ was there? I'm not even disputing, you know, here or there. Someone says, is this dress nice? Just guys, just walking with you. Just remember you have the Holy Spirit. And you wear that kind of dress. And the Holy Ghost say that, I have to come out of this body. I can't be here. I have to come out of this body. I cannot be here with this kind of dress. There are things you wear that shows that it's more of a demon presence than more of the Holy Spirit presence. Glory to God. Does your bank account show you are born again? Your bank account shows that you have loyalty to British Airlines, to Delta Airlines, to Louis Vuitton. Does this show loyalty to God's kingdom? The way you spend money is going to be different if you are now a disciple. That's the thing. Because the values of the disciples are different. Does it show... Can I... Listen to me. If I look at your life, do I have enough proof from your social media that you're a Christian? If I look at your Instagram, can I find enough proof that you know Christ? I find enough proof that you're an Arsenal fan. I find enough proof that you're a Barcelona fan. I find enough proof that you love Gucci and Fe, Fe, you know, and Prada. I find enough proof that you eat a lot and you fly to different countries. That you've been to Mauritius and Barcelona and this and that. But I can't find proof that you read the Bible. I can't find proof that you know the Holy Spirit. I can't find proof that you know Jesus. There's no proof. And that's why people keep suggesting to you things. Because they don't know where you stand. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. How do I know if I'm growing as a Christian? Am I changing? How do, someone says how do I know if I'm growing as a Christian? Let me help you. 
the way you know you're growing as a Christian is this. Is my perspective becoming more like Christ? I might find it easy to forgive. I might find it easier to forgive. It's a journey. Sometimes it's not a one-day journey. I might find it easier to trust God. I might see if I link the act of prayer over worry. That is the way that shows I'm growing as a Christian. Have I learned the act of forgiveness? Have I learned some self-discipline? Normally, I would wreck out and rage and use the F word. You know, it's amazing, this generation, because this generation thinks there's nothing wrong with the F word. <laughs> You're lucky I'm not God. <laughs> the next time you use it, you'll be on the way to hellfire. <laughs> You're lucky. And the reason why, let me tell you something. The problem with Christian, especially when this, with the people I speak with, I don't know about other people, is that most people sin when it's cultural. Just not to be. So, when you see people that normally they will not say F word, but when they get into this class of people, and everybody just throwing, pah, pah, throwing it, they will just throw their own. That, like, we have to be cool. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. Let me show you that scripture. Yeah, I don't want to tell you. I want you to see from the Bible. There's something about reading from the word of God. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing that even during this period, you see? Oh, wow. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. Can we read together? He says, Thou shalt not follow what? Multitude to do evil. That means, All that's me, I may not. There are certain things I cannot do because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Living together when you're not married is still wrong. You know, church is funny. You look at the one that got pregnant and you castigate her. Then the ones that live together, you leave them. Those ones are living in sin. That one sinned. Church will throw stones at homosexuals. But the people that have sex as a marriage, are they not the same? Because you know what church does? The sin I don't sin is bigger. As far as not the one sinning it, it's bigger. So once you, you don't have same-sex attraction, you're a saint. But the one that is still, because the two of them are caught fornication and adultery, I hope you know. Yes. Please, let me stay with the Bible. Though. <laughs> Praise God. The reason why I'm saying so is that Chuma, come. Where's Chuma? Is he here? Pastor, come, yeah. The, the pastor in white. Yeah, I need someone here. Yeah. Come, come, yeah. Is Truma here? He's not available. I need someone else that is available. Who else is huge? Like, you know, just. Is he here? He's coming. Hey, Truma, come here. It's amazing. The other day I called him, all the single kids, like, oh. Pull me. This is the reason why you're not growing. The flesh and the spirit have equal hold in your life. That's the reason why. So, you take, you go for one press. This spirit or white is spirit. You go for one press. You take three steps forward. One, two, three. Spirit is winning. Then, then what happened? February 14 comes. Flesh will drag everything that spirit has given you. Flesh will come and collect it. Praise God. Yeah, that's what happens. That's what happens. You, you, you come for Sunday service, three days fasting and prayer, spirits will drag you. Did you know? Then 
something has to happen. Friday night, flesh will just take over. Everything. You now wonder, why am I not going as a Christian? Because the flesh and the spirit has what equal hold on you. Glory to God. You know what to do, right? Disconnect the flesh. Someone says, disconnect the flesh. It's simple. There's some relationship you have to disconnect to grow spiritually. Thank you. All right. Ready? That was, I'm, I'm just testing the microphone. I've not said preaching. No. Just testing the microphone. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Because I'm talking about living without regret. Living what? Without regret. Living without regret. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Just testing the microphone. I mean, look at all these handsome men here. You are meant to be ushers. Why are you not an usher? Tell me. Is it that you are too big to serve in the house of God? I'm talking to all the men. The same thing with the women. It's true. When they go to party, you are the one they will see walking up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. In the house of God, you will see that like stew. I'm challenging you to live for God. That's what I'm doing. See, it's intentional. I'm challenging you that don't feel comfortable with coming to church because that's not what God wanted. What God wants is to live through you. That's what God wants. You know what God wants? God wants you as a bank manager, you're a greeter. And your, one of your customer walks in and sees you say, welcome to church. Say, hey, see the bank manager. And he's so overwhelmed like with how far he is in life. See what he's doing for Christ. All of the girls that look up to you on Instagram, they come to you, you greet out an usher in church. And they say, you say, hey, welcome to church. That's your seat. They're like, hey, with all these 1 million followers, 300,000 followers on Twitter, see what she's doing. And they are inspired. That's what it means for God to get the glory through your life. That's what it means. So I'm hoping that I can provoke you. I'm hoping that I can have ladies that can say, nobody saw my pants, yet I did well in business. And I'm saying it so that we can raise a generation of women that can, were not abused and were successful. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. The reason why you must serve God is this. Let me tell you something. Eh? Everybody has a hole in the heart that only serving and living for God can fill. I'm telling you, sometimes you hear, you know, when, when I was praying for this teaching, we were talking about um, the guy that founded Apple, Steve Jobs, and how towards the end of his life, he had huge regrets. And I said, that hole is always there. Do you notice that suicide is not prevalent among the poor? It's common among the rich. The reason why rich people commit suicide, let me tell you today. This is the reason why rich people. Rich people always think when I have this amount of money and wealth, I'll be very happy. So when they get it and they're not happy, they start disappointment. And they don't know where else to look for fulfillment and happiness, so they kill themselves. A lot of people that are rich are very unhappy. I'm telling you, the happiest people are in the villages. The happiest, they're in the villages. If that dollar goes up, then that comes down. They are very, because the reason why is that happiness is state of mind. You thought, once I acquire more, I'll become more happy. Are you not more happy? You are more famous, you've had more money, you are married, you have children. Are you more happy? That's why the biggest thing can give yourself is your happiness. You thought, once you got married, you'll be more happy. Are you not more happy as a married person? Is a married not a burden? And the, you, you think it's your partner. It's not your partner. It's the mindset. Because once you come into mind to get happy, you'll be very sad. Once you Listen to me. Let me say it again in case you didn't hear. I want to increase the volume. Once you come into relationship or mind to be happy, you'll be very sad. The reason why is that you came into relationship to take. No, sir. You have to come to give. The happiness you don't have personally, nobody can give it to you. You know who disagrees with me? Someone that is unhappy in their relationship disagrees with me. And that's why you're unhappy. But you still disagree. That's why some people, they experience delay and unhappiness in marriage. Because they are looking for what does not exist. I'm looking for someone that will make me happy. 
The person does not exist. The person that will make you happy is you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I'm late for someone that will take yourself out. What's wrong with you? Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And I'm saying it because you need to learn. You need to learn. You need to learn. A lot of people are very unhappy. A lot of people are very unhappy. It, it's a, it, sometimes it's a very damaging thing for me. They are overwhelmed. They're unhappy. And I say, and the reason why is that a lot of things happen that makes you unhappy. What do you do for yourself that builds happiness back into you? For example, you're unhappy right now. You're in, on your bed watching the service. How would that help you be happy? Okay, watching the service is one step. But being in the physical service would go a longer way. Didn't you hear what David said? He said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house. There's a glad, there's a joy that comes. Praise God. All right. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. I don't even know how I got here this morning. So let me say something quickly here. Because the spirit of God brought to my attention, but I couldn't say it in the first service. When I was praying this morning, he brought to my attention. Then he brought my attention in the first service. They want to say it now. Many of you have ideas of what you should do that runs through your mind. The way you know what to do is that take those ideas and begin to pray about it. Two things. Begin to pray about the ideas. The reason why is that whatever you're praying about, I, I want to say in a structured way. Father, help me. A lot of people are very concerned about the next step to take. And they have a lot of thoughts that should I do this? Should I do that? This is how God helps you. When you begin to pray, and watch this now. Please watch this because I know you pray. This is a praying church. The way you go forward is that as you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit will begin to push ideas in your heart. Most of you that are not trained think those ideas are distraction. Take a minute and write them down. Take a minute and write them down. So, once you write down the idea, in another time of prayer, I'm teaching you, spirit, these are spiritual operations. So. These are spiritual operations. In another time of prayer, you take the ideas and say, Lord, one, two, three, four, five, and begin to pray. And the one the Spirit of God wants you to do, you will focus on it. That's the second step. The third step is this. Once you know what the Spirit of God wants you to do, you go into cancel mode. Look for those ahead of you and say, this is what the Spirit of God has inspired me to do. How should I do it? Those people are dream interpreters. They will begin to interpret what the Spirit of God has set up in your heart. Because the Bible says through cancel, every enterprise is established. Through cancel, every enterprise is established. Someone say Hallelujah. Okay, second Corinth, second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. That was I just didn't get that out of my spirit. Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen. So sometimes, watch this now. You can do a good spiritual idea and it fails. It can fail because it was not done right because you lacked cancel. Number two, it can fail because the timing was wrong. So he makes all things beautiful in his time. Timing is key. And sometimes, it's because of cancel. So, the, the wise men saw the star. But they went to see Herod for cancel. Herod's cancel diverted them from the plan of God. Glory to God. Second Timothy 3 verse 16. The Bible says all scripture, and this is the purpose of the Bible, the scriptures, is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Why I'm going to the word reproof? The word reproof means for evidence. For evidence. So, someone says, how do you know if something is right or wrong? Our evidence in determining as Christians, if something is right or wrong, is not what social media says, it's the word of God. You need to understand this. This is fundamental of Christianity. What we used to determine if something is right or wrong is not popular opinion, it's not party affiliation. 
what we used to determine is not science what we used to determine if something is right or wrong is what does the bible say because the bible says that the scripture is given for what reproof the word reproof means the, is the word elec, elenco, which is used in Hebrews 11 word, when it says faith, sort of things, so forth. The evidence that word evidence seems to word reproof is evidence. What does that mean? Someone said to me that, um, I want you to, someone to tell me, he said that someone said to me, he said that they told me who my husband is. One prophet told me my husband, but I don't like him. I said, That's fine, just show me the Bible, just Christ chose husband for people. Then she became dumbfounded. He said, but he said the Holy Spirit said, let me say something to you. I want to help today. The original Pentecostal churches in Nigeria, in Africa, they had one problem. All the most, all those white garment churches, some of them, it was not as if God was not with them when they started. That's, the, that's not the truth. Some of them started with the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you what happened. Because they were started by illiterates, they could not really read even the revelation they had was given to them. So what happened is that eventually those people exalted revelation more than Bible study. What happened eventually? What happened was this. Bible was cancelled. So one man will now say, God say, I should marry two wives. One man will now say, God say, I should marry your wife. So revelation was now conflicting with what revelation. But because they did not understand the supremacy of the word of God. They were not able to judge revelation. So that movement went into error. So that's why you will hear that sometimes those government churches, they will go and pray at the graveyard. They will go and pray at the graveyard. The reason why is that when those things start from revelation, this is the danger of revelation without balance in the word of God. You must understand, every revelation must be judged by scriptures. How do I know? First Corinthians 14. Bible says, if two or three prophesy, let them sit down and judge. What they judge is not by revelation. They judge by scriptures. Are you getting it? The reason why I'm saying so is that I'm not, not, I'm aware that some of you, they give you revelation. I I met a lady and she attended, I met a lady and they told her when she was 18 that there's a mark on her head that she'll never marry. I said, okay. She's in her 30s right now. She's not married. She's very worried. I said to her, when they say there's a mark on your head, what do you should do about it? They said there's nothing. I said that prophet is a wicked person. I said our God does not show problem without answers. I said that prophet is a wicked person. You know what? Even the girl, because she's heady for so long, it's affected her mindset. I told her, I said, what is longer, is longer spiritual? I looked at her, I said that. I said, you don't even dress well. I said, when does you do dress as if you find a husband? He said, I don't do that, sir. Because the prophecy has transferred to your mindset. They'll just look at you and say, you're a firstborn. And they'll give you one. They told me, or they told me I would die young. Yeah, by the time I was 15, they told, they, they told me, the person went to a mountain called Oketabura. So it's not something the, the Mount of Tabura. He wrote full letter. Wrote, he told me that I would do it, then I would die young. So my mother gave me the prophecy when he came back from the mountain after fasting 40 days. I, mean, I was already born again. So I took it. I said, I disagree. I agree. So the one I agreed with, I began to confess it. The one I disagreed to, I said, back to sender. Hey, is that okay? Guess what? Both the prophet, both my mother, both my auntie that went there, they are all dead. I'm the one that is alive. The reason why is that the prophecy that happens in your life is what you believe. Are, are you getting me? I'm, you know, I, I'm telling you because there's a tendency. And that's why when you are looking for prayer everywhere, first of all, I have a problem with it. Because first of all, you don't know that God loves you. My case is not special though. God is on it. Did you read... Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 before. I've read it before. Read from the message translation. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Oh, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Lift up your hands and shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See what the Bible says. Media people, you need to always give me the exact verse. The exact verse, not the, because this is very difficult. But I know where, I know where to start from. Where verse 11 starts from is this. It says... 
I know what I am doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. You know what God is saying? Let me tell you something. See, you must understand that you are not God. So, God is like someone flying on an aeroplane. When you fall on an aeroplane and you look at the whole of the city, you see it differently. You can see everything arranged together. But when you're in the city, you cannot see what's happening there, what's happening there. So, when God says, I know what I'm doing, from where he is, he can see everything. About your marriage, God knows what he's doing. About your papers, he knows what he's doing. About your finance, he knows what he's doing. Don't run up and down and collect what is on your own. Read. This is a Bible. I didn't write it. See what it says. Verse 11. I want, I want, I want the message translation. I want the, this is King James. I know. I want the message translation. It says, I know. The, you know what? Let me tell you something then. Eh? Um, if I just say to Pastor Tony, he said, Pastor, you stand up. Walk. Be walking towards me. Hey, be careful. What will come to your mind? That there's something I've seen that I've said, be careful for. For God to say, I know what I'm doing, it means that he sees there will be a time in your life you will think that God does not know what he's doing. So he saw ahead of time and says, when you want to get overwhelmed, confused, when it seems as if I'm silent and nothing's happening, remember, I know what I'm doing. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Please, you can have your set. So, we're talking about the scriptures. We say all scripture is given by God for, by, by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. And for doctrine, teachings, doctrines means teachings. The other one is reproof, reproof moves evidence. So, the, someone says they gave me a prophecy. The way we know if that prophecy is right or wrong is what the word of God said. One pastor says that if you want all your children to marry, well, bring an offering. Who did Jesus Christ ask an offering for to give a miracle? I believe in challenging people to give, but why, man, why the manipulation? We had Isaac offering. All of the people gave generously, but why the manipulation? You know why people might? Because they didn't trust that the church members would respond to a genuine call to give. It says it's for reproof, for correction. The third one is this. For what? For correction and for instruction of righteousness. Three things are important. You must have three voices in your life. You must have a voice that instructs you. You must have the voice of instruction. You must have the voice of instruction. There must be places you take instructions from. That is consistent with the word of God. Three voices are important in your life. The voice of instruction. See, it's here. It's for reproof, for correction, for instruction. The second voice you must have is this. You must have the voice of encouragement. Everybody in his life will need the voice of instruction. The voice of instruction. Do you have someone that can show you the path? The primary instruct, the, pers- the primary person that instructs is the Holy Spirit. And not just the Holy Spirit, men and women he has placed in your life. The second thing is the voice of correction. I'm grateful I have father in the faith. I have mentors. I'm grateful. I'm eternally grateful. It's a gift to me. I will have destroyed my destiny if not for them. When you see men or women that don't have people that guide them, it shows in their life. Because the one that is raised by a father and the one that raises himself are very different. Praise God. I'm grateful that as a pastor, I have a pastor. That I report to. It's a gift to me. I'm grateful I receive instructions. Who do you receive instructions from? So you must have the voice of instruction. You must have the voice of encouragement. The voice that always encourages you. Many people have the voice of discouragement. And criticism. Who is a voice? Who does God? Who are the people that their job in your life is to fan your fire in is to fan your flame into fire?
The third voice is this. You must have the voice of correction. For correction. Is that correction I want to stay on? Because most people understand the voice of instruction. They understand the voice of... And this is discipleship. As you disciple people, there are... You know why instructions are very powerful? There are some things you will not understand till later. But you will do them first. Many of you didn't understand why math was compulsory. Until later. Some of you still don't understand right now. But when you're very good in math, your cognitive ability, your, the, the way to reason. Yes, yes. The voice of correction. Because we're talking about discipleship. So, for you to move from a child of God to a disciple, you must have those voices. The voice of instruction. The voice of what? Encouragement. And the voice of correction. Why is correction important? And what is correction? Correction is a major tool for transformation. If you want to get better, God must begin to correct you. When you see a Christian that stopped growing, he has stopped obeying. He has stopped listening to correction. Correction is a major tool for transformation. Correction is a major tool. You will, you will, you will hear God. Listen. They read through the Bible. Jesus Christ corrected Peter, corrected him, corrected him, corrected Thomas, corrected Andrew, corrected, corrected. Why do you think he will not correct you today? Even Abraham, the father of faith, he told Abraham, he said, walk before me and be that perfect. He says, you are not walking perfect. Rewalk. The voice, correction is a major tool for transformation. The reason people are not growing is that they are resisting correction. God is saying, change the way you talk. You have been on five years. You have not changed that correction since. God says, change your eating habits. You have been on it. Be very kind to your husband. You have been on it. Be very kind to your wife. You have been on it. Submit to your husband. You have been on it. The voice of correction. God says, you've been, no, take off responsibility in church. You say, I'm very busy. The voice. And you will notice because God does not force his will on you, once you don't follow the correction, he lets you be. Ha! May God not let you be by yourself. I always pray it every time. Father, don't leave me to myself. Ah! Father, don't leave me to myself. Ah! Lord, don't leave me to myself. Ah! It's a dangerous thing when God says, okay, do it by yourself. What, what, what do I know? Who do I know? Where did I come from that I can do it by myself? I remember where I came from. I remember who I am. Just a young boy down the street. Then all of a sudden, because of all this small, small, small breakthrough, mm, 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 you're not becoming mad. You're forming macho for God. You must be careful. The voice of correction. See what the Bible is about correction. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 18. See what the Bible says. So, correction is a major tool of transformation. You must remember that. Correction is a major tool of transformation. Correction is a major tool of... So, my change and spiritual growth or transformation is very dependent on me heeding corrections. See what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 1 in verse 8, not 18. Verse 8. Can we pray a prayer just now? Lift up your hands and stand on your feet. Father, anywhere I need to make adjustment, show me. Go ahead and pray. Father, anywhere I need to make adjustment as, as a Christian, as a man, as a woman, as a husband, as a father, Father, show me. Go ahead and pray, everybody. Lord, I, I will not be proud. Anywhere I need to make adjustment, don't leave me by myself. Spirit of God, show me. Lord, don't leave me by myself. Show me in my relationship life. Anywhere I need to make adjustment, show out of your mercy, show me. In Jesus' name we pray. Please, you can have your seat. Correction is a major tool of transformation. To refuse correction is 
is to refuse growth. So you cannot grow beyond your willingness to be corrected. See what the Bible says. My son, hear the instruction of your father. It was a cancel. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 1. The, chapter 10 verse 1. It says, my son, hear the instruction of your father. Do not forsake the law of your mother. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 1. A wise son that hears the instruction makes the father's heart glad. This is discipleship. When you don't do what you want, discipline, do what you have to do. This is discipleship. Glory to God. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12. Correction. Correction. The voice of correction. Where do you need to? The reason why, I, I, I will tell you why correction is important. I want to read verse 12 to you. Because you must know that correction is a function of God's love and mercy. Because it doesn't want you to crash. It shows you mercy by correcting you. Because he doesn't want you to stumble. He shows you mercy by correcting you. He corrects you ahead of danger. He corrects you ahead of trouble. Look at Proverbs chapter 3 verse 12. As I'm talking to you right now, some of you, God is bringing my corrections to you. And you don't realize that his correction is a function of his love and grace. It says, he that, he that is often reproof and hardens his neck, his neck shall be broken without remedy. That's what the Bible says. See what the Bible says. For the Lord loves, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. This word that you don't like correction, you cannot go far with Christ. With all the preaching you have heard now, don't you know some things that you have laid aside and some you pick up? Because of this message, we spoke about a lot of corrections. Which one pertains to you? Corrections. Is it the, the is it whom the Lord loves? He corrects. Correction is a demonstration of God's love and mercy. God says, forgive. So I'll not forgive. I said, that's fine. We will be stuck. You are God. God is teaching you say, about your giving. Do this, do this, do this. The seven in the house of God. He said, I don't have time. Will God fight you? He said, it's true, you don't have time. When you come here, you have time. Correction is a demonstration of God's love and mercy. Our response to correspond, our response to correction is called adjustment. That's why you pray that prayer. Our response to what correction is what? Adjustment. God says, Remember not the former things of old. You are still crying over the relationship that broke two years ago. And you will come to church and they will tell you, remember not the things of old. You will be saying, he broke my heart. And God says, okay, since you want to live in the past, stay in the past. Because the people that live in the past shall return to the past. Accepting correction. It's something that's beautiful. That Lord, it is how you're leading me, I'll change. Lord, you want me to serve? I will. Lord, I need to make adjustment in my character? I will. I need to make adjustment in my marriage? I will. It's not easy, but I will. I need to make adjustments in my giving? I will. Correction. Adjustment is the right response to correction. Correction does not bring about growth. It's a tool. What brings growth is adjustment. That's what brings growth. In the process of adjusting to correction, you find yourself growing. You find yourself growing. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. You find yourself growing. There are two kinds of correction. There's a correction of what God tells you give you instructions. Turn right, turn left. That's wonderful. But the biggest correction is when God changes your perspective. You know why? That changes everything. One of the key perspectives that God wants to change about your life is this. 
It's your perspective about life. Oh, 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 they, give me some money, please. Just one envelope that has some money. Just one envelope. I need some more, maybe five more. Five thousand or more, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Praise God. Which will I call now? Is it Pastor Fido or you will come? Who is going to come? Who? Be- because it's money, right? Everybody wants. <laughs> okay, Pastor Nate, come. God wants to change your perspective. He wants to correct it. I like to correct it today. Please help me hold this money. Because you are holding the money, is it yours? No, sir. Because you are holding the money, can you spend on whatever you like? No, I can't. I can't. If you choose to spend it, are you irresponsible or not? I'm irresponsible if I spend it. Many of you don't know that this is how life looks like. Your life is not your own because you didn't give yourself. God sat in heaven, counted life. 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50, 80. He said, take 85 years. He gave 85 years. All of a sudden, you think that the purpose of the 85 years is to spend on yourself. So, as you're living through life now, you just be saying, this is it. But, you don't even, you don't, this, it was not even your choice. Listen to me. You know how I know you didn't choose to be born? The way I know is that if you chose to be born, you would not choose to be born in Nigeria. And that's, right. that's at least that time I can prove. Some of you will never choose your own parents. If God sat down, he chose your parents, chose your location, gave you life, everything, and says, take and all of a sudden, you take the life and you want to leave it to yourself. He just said it. He said, I'm irresponsible. Is that not what people are doing with their life? Irresponsible living is a life you live solely to yourself. You know why? At the end of the day, the one that gave you life will come back for it. And say, what I gave you, account for it. He, because you'll have spent it. He will not say, account for it. I say, Mm. Uh, I built a house in Parkview. God says, where is that? Because all of that is nothing here. No house is rapturable. No career has a fight in heaven. <laughs> I'm ND of First Bank. <laughs> Someone said, what is that? Because banks don't have heavenly reference. What is recorded in heaven is what is done for Christ. You must remember that when the, when the trumpet sounds, because the trumpet will sound, that it's only what is done for Christ. You can't even say, my husband was a pastor, my wife was this, and that's my duty. No, it's on an individual yeah. basis. Life is a trust. Life is what? A trust. It's not my own. It's a trust. Be careful, because in life, in life, there are two ways to spend the money. You are either going to invest it or you are going to what? Spend it. The question is that, are you investing your life or you are spending it? I love the way the Yoruba says it because Yoruba word for enjoying life this means to spend it. You chop life. Are you chopping life or you are investing life? You know what? Chopping life, when you are here, it's so enjoyable. But at the end, you will pay. But when you invest life, it's so painful in the interim. But at the end, you will enjoy. When you see Jesus Christ, what will he say to you? Great man. <laughs> you chopped life. Is it Master, I chopped it. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. One guy, I want us to close. One guy made a lot of money. And uh, when he made a lot of money, he was going to die. 
he thought about a way he could take some part of his world to heaven. And I said, he knows what to do. He will, he will turn, he, he took his money, converted a lot of them into raw gold, bars of gold, bars of gold. This is a joke, it's not a real life story. He now prayed to God that God will give him permission to bring things to heaven. And God said, okay, he gave permission to bring a box. So when he got to heaven, he brought a box of gold. But then he, he went through a lot to get the permission from God. So at the heaven's gate, Angel Gabriel said, hello. As he was coming, he said, what do you have in your box? He said, I have a special permission. Oh, you're the person. Oh, wow. We went through a lot to approve the process for you to get a special permission from God. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. What do you have in your box? Because Angel was like, ah, this thing that you went through a lot of process to get permission from God to bring this box. They opened the box and the angel looked at him. He said, you went through all of that to get pavement? Do you hear what he said? He said, you went through all of that to get pavement. He said, what do you mean? He said, these are pavements in heaven. We use it for the roads. He said, these are what we used to pave the roads. These are interlocking stones. Because in heaven, the roads are made of gold. That was it. The question is this. Are you good? How does a disciple think? Disciple remembers. This life is not my own. I was given as a trust. So I must lead the life for him that gave me his life. He died that you may live. The life he should have had, he died. That your own life might be his own life. And today, we we'll live our life through him. Let's pray. Will you stand on your feet? Let's pray.